My friends, uh, if you are just scrolling through and you hear absolutely nothing else from me today, I want you to hear that you are beautiful, you are loved by God, and there's nothing else you or anybody in the world can do about it. Uh, and if you are sticking around with me this morning, I am so, so glad. My name is Will Ed Green. I serve as an associate pastor and the director of discipleship at Foundry United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C., uh, and I'm really excited to start my week off with you today. Uh, if you have a moment and you're watching, I see some folks are slowly starting to come on. Um, I want to invite you to give me a shout out in the chat so I can know where you're joining in from. Uh, it helps me to know who you are, um, to celebrate the fact that you've been with me. Uh, and it also gives us all a chance uh, to see just how big and wide this community we're creating together online really is. I see Michael is uh, joining us from Arlington, recently back from a trip. Welcome home, uh, despite the cold and dark. Uh, we're glad you're with us today. Uh, so if you were with us in worship uh, yesterday at Foundry, I had the chance to preach. It's always a gift to be able to join our community in that way. Uh, and you'll know that uh, the sermon series we're in, Good Tidings, had us focusing on the good tidings of forgiveness we receive uh, at Advent. And a lot of the sermon really kind of focused on how uh, important it is for us to learn and to trust and believe that we're really worthy of the kind of freedom God gives us uh, through forgiving our sins, right? That can be hard, uh, I said yesterday, and I continue to kind of reflect on, uh, because we do live in a world where we're taught to keep score. Uh, you know, this person did this thing, this person did this thing. It's almost as if we keep this mental checklist, right? Uh, of all the bad things we've done, all the bad things people have done to us. Um, sometimes that gives us a sense like we have power over other people, right? Sometimes it helps us to insulate ourselves from being vulnerable with others. Uh, we just, we learn so easily in this world how to, um, how to judge ourselves by the very worst things we've ever done, right? And yet, as we remembered yesterday, God continues to pursue us again and again and again in scripture, the whole story we receive from Genesis uh, all the way to the end in Revelation is that God's love for us is big enough and wide enough uh, to hold all of that stuff that we do, both the good and the bad, and even more importantly, that God's love is a, a hungry kind of love. It pursues us relentlessly. Uh, it follows us wherever we go. Long before we ever know it, we call that prevenient grace in the Methodist Church. It meets us in moments where we're uh, re realizing and recognizing uh, the stuff that we've been carrying around we need to set down and, and says that's okay too. That's justifying grace. And then God continues to show up uh, even when we mess up after that. Uh, offering us sanctifying grace, the hope that each day we can do a little bit better by God's grace than we did the day before. Now, some of you have probably heard this uh, more than once in your life. I think it's a message we can all afford to hear over and over again, uh, in part because uh, it can be really easy to think of forgiveness and grace as this kind of feel-good message where we, uh, we we get together and we pat ourselves on the back and we say it's okay. Um and that, that makes us feel good, right? But, but forgiveness, the kind of forgiveness uh, that we talked about yesterday that I'm talking about today, offered to us by God's grace, is this powerful and profound uh, gift that we're given in our spiritual lives. It's a discipline that we're called not only um, uh, to, to kind of perceive in Scripture, but to receive and practice in our lives. It's something that we have to learn how to do. Uh, because without it, without the practice of receiving forgiveness, of recognizing, A, that we need it, because we all need it, right? And B, that God offers it freely and without uh, without uh, threat of judgment or suffering, um, we begin to believe, really, that we're nothing more than the sum of our sins, uh, that we're the sum of all the broken things that, that uh, we have caused in the world, of all the stuff that's not quite right in our lives. Um, and that leads to all kinds of dysfunction, right? I mean, if you've ever been in a relationship with somebody where uh, you're feeling a, a deep sense of shame or guilt, uh, anybody ever been there and done that, right? Like it, it shifts the way that you move around a person, the way you speak to a person, the way you feel around a person. 
Um, well, oftentimes in those relationships in the long term, you begin to pull apart from the person because there's a hurt um, or a wrong that's not been um, addressed or named. Uh, and that's true in all of our relationships, including with God, right? Like when we learn to see ourselves as good, only by measuring ourselves against others, right? Not really receiving forgiveness, but just saying, oh, well, at least I'm not that person, right? Um, or the opposite, I'll never be as good as that person. Um, we immediately throw up roadblocks that keep us from being authentic and vulnerable with people uh, in our lives. Um, that constant comparison undermines what we what we profess to be true as people of faith, right? That we are imbued with, we are gifted with the image of God. That um, that uh, we are we are each uh, valuable, right? So the more comparing that we do, either of ourselves against others or others against ourselves the more we become kind of objects in this game of shame that we play. Um, and the less we become children of God, right? The less we're able to recognize both the, the, the beauty and brokenness that each of us uh, kind of embody in the world. Ultimately, if you've been in a relationship like this, you'll know that that, that creates a lot of resentment, right? And if you've ever recognized uh, a place where you're feeling really resentful, you'll know just how deadly um that that can be in relationships and and to our spiritual well-being as well right the more resentment we have uh, of people who are uh forcing us to confront our own guilt and shame um the the more we begin to uh, pull away to isolate ourselves to withdraw in ways that keep us from doing sometimes the hard work we need to do um, of, of confrontation of something that we've done wrong or confrontation with an idea or a, a thing that we kind of embody that we need to change. Uh, this keeping score just really does all kinds of damage. Uh, and it, it can leave us bereft of the very resources we need to do the work that God calls us to do in the world. The people, the communities, uh, the practices, the spiritual disciplines, and the, the kind of embodied knowledge of God's love we need to do the work of justice and mercy uh, and prophetic witness in the world. We are created for more than that kind of living. We are capable of more than that. And the discipline of receiving God's forgiveness, of putting ourselves in places where we can honestly examine our lives, where we can honestly examine the baggage that we're carrying around with us in our relationship with others, helps us to begin to grow in the kind of trust and freedom that allows us to move in the world uh, with much more grace. You know, when you're not carrying around all that other stuff we've been talking about, uh, you can trust that yes, you will in fact mess up, right? You're not gonna be perfect. You can release that need if there are any perfectionists who are with us today. Um, I'm one of those. Uh, if you saw the nine o'clock sermon on Sunday, you'll have seen it in action. Um, it, it, it can release us from that drive to be perfect uh, that does some real damage uh, to our own emotional well-being, And it makes us more open this practice of receiving forgiveness, more open to receiving the gifts of the people who are around you when you need them, right? The more that you can be vulnerable with your own need for forgiveness, more authentic with the stuff in your life you need to let go of, the more you can be vulnerable and authentic with other people and begin to receive the gifts that they are giving into your life so that you can do what God has called you to do. Um, this kind of growth uh, also allows us, I think, in this really beautiful way to take the kind of risks that we all need to take from time to time. Uh, whether it's a risk in a relationship, it's starting something new that's unexpected and, and perhaps a little scary, uh, whether it's a new job, uh, whether it's speaking out in a space where a truth needs to be spoken, like at a Christmas table where somebody's saying something really racist um, or sexist or homophobic, uh, trusting that God will give us the strength that we need, that God will give us the community that we need to support us in that work, whether uh, it's a prophetic witness at the dinner table or it's um, simply stepping into something new. Uh, and it allows us this practice of receiving forgiveness to begin to do something that I think is really critical in the work of our regular discipleship, right? It allows us to be free 
to set down things that have served us well in a season of life, but that we need to let go of, um, whether that's a spiritual discipline, a prayer practice, whether that's a relationship, uh, whether that's, a, uh, again, a job or something like that, so that we can pick up the next thing we need as we transition into the next stage of life. Because here's what we know to be true. As we do this work of discipleship, as we move through the journey, there are seasons in which God gives us what we need along the way. Um, and there are moments when we're called to put something down to pick something else up so we can live more fully and freely in that season. This practice of being able to receive God's forgiveness allows us to begin to recognize those things in ways that um, are honest, in ways that are faithful, uh, and, and to do so and in, in, in be able to trust, really trust, um, that, that we're going to have what we need. So I want to invite us today as we continue moving through this season of Advent. Um, this is a practice that I've picked up myself again in this season um, to try something called the examine. Now, if you don't know the examine, it's an invitation at the end of each day um, to, to take a look back at the day uh, and to just kind of consider where you saw God at work, uh, where you felt yourself maybe chafing against something, where you felt yourself really feeling free or living into something, uh, and where you feel like God might be calling you to go next as you wake up the next day. Uh, my good friend, well, I say friend, uh, I feel like he's, he's a friend, even though I've never met him. Um, spiritual companion, John O'Donohue, has a beautiful way of asking some of these questions in his book to bless the space between us. If you've never picked this book up, I highly recommend it. Some beautiful blessings. Uh, but he's got a series of questions that he calls, at the end of the day, a mirror of questions that I think might be helpful for us. And I'll put this in the chat a little bit later so that we can see it. Um, it's just a series of questions that help us begin to examine ourselves in ways um, that allow us to receive the gift of forgiveness and grace God offers. He asks, uh, what dreams did I create last night? Where did my eyes linger today? Where was I unable to perceive? Or where was I blind? Where was I hurt without anybody noticing? Not where did I hurt somebody, where was I hurt? What did I learn? What did I read? What new thoughts visited me? What differences did I notice in those closest to me? Whom did I neglect? Where did I neglect myself? What did I begin today that might endure? How were my conversations? What did I do today for the poor and the excluded? Did I remember the dead today? Where could I have exposed myself to the risk of something different? That's a powerful question. Where did I allow myself to receive love? With whom today did I feel most myself? What reached me today? How deep did it imprint? Who saw me today? What visitations had I from the past and from the future? What did I avoid today? And here's the question that gets me every time. From the evidence, why was I given this day? You see, these questions, they help us step into what yesterday I called the, the wildernesses of our sin and brokenness, the places where we've created some habits and patterns and ways of being that are maybe rough um, or uncomfortable or confusing or that we get lost in. And they then help us uh, begin to just to name them and to trust that in naming them, God is going to give us what we need to move past that uh, in the day that comes ahead. So I want to encourage you to practice the exam, and you can do it in a written fashion. You can sit and, uh, and just journal. You can even do it with a partner if you really want to, if you've got a significant other or a friend that you trust. Um, or you can even, you know, just sit and do it in your head if that works for you too. Whatever works, let me encourage you to pick up that practice um, over the course of the next couple of weeks and just see what it might hold for you, how you might find some freedom in your relationship with God or your relationship with others. So that's what I've got for us today. Uh, that's where my head has been and will probably continue to be for some time. Uh, as uh, we go out, I want to share with you a blessing also from John O'Donohue uh, and just a word or two about stuff that's coming up here at Foundry in this next season. He writes, May all that is unforgiven in you be released. May your fears yield their deepest tranquillities. 
May all that is unlived in you blossom into a future graced with love. I'll be praying that for you all this week, um, and I hope that you'll continue to join uh, me on Mondays. You can join Pastor Ginger on Wednesdays at noon for her ponderings from the Purple Parlor. Uh, of course, we're continuing in Advent. We have our Advent special music this Sunday. It's going to be brilliant. Uh, 9 o'clock will be carols. Uh, 11.15 will be a piece by Bach called Awake Sleeper. Uh, you can join us for both of those uh, online or in person. We have Christmas uh, longest night services for those who might be experiencing some grief or just not feeling the holly jollies um, on December 21st at 7 p.m. Christmas Eve at 8 o'clock, it'll be carols and candlelight. There'll be a children's message and ways for families to participate. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the 26th of December, we'll have one service, a celebration of carols, where we'll spend some time singing together some of our favorite Christmas hymns uh, and learning a little bit more about their history and story. So lots to engage in in the coming weeks. I hope that you'll continue to plug in. Uh, and as always, uh, trust and know uh, that uh, we love you, that God loves you, uh, and keep on keeping on. Till the next time, take good care.